please welcome Karen Desmond. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up. I am blown away by the size of this audience. Can anybody hear, can everybody hear me okay, first of all? A little louder? A little louder? Is there another setting for loudness, or should I just hold it closer? There we go, okay. So if you, in the middle, if I forget, please just raise your hand and say, talk louder. I have a small voice, so please feel free to interrupt me. Like I said, when I was uh, on my way down here tonight, I was thinking, this is going to be a small group. It's going to be a very intimate group. I'm going to know a few people there, and it's going to be fun. And then I realized they're recording this. And I got to start to get a little bit nervous in the pit of my stomach. I thought, oh, well, that'll be fine. I'll just forget that the camera's there. It'll be fine. And then people started coming in. And they just kept coming in, and they kept coming in. And this size of this crowd is just amazing to me. So thank you all for being here. And thank you for loving history enough to be here and to care about history. One of the things I like to start a talk out with is to say, you know, I hated history when I was in high school. Anybody like that hated history? It's no fun. I totally blame my teachers for that because when I got a little older, history got to be really interesting. And why didn't they have that in high school? So I'm hoping to share with you history tonight that you'll find interesting. It's certainly history that my husband and I find interesting. We're kind of passionate about the hidden stories, the forgotten stories, the stories that people don't tell all the time. I mean, everybody's heard Snowshoe Thompson, right? and Judge Virgin and Lillian Finnegan, and those are important people. They're important parts of our history, important parts of our past. But I like knowing about the ones that nobody told you about, and the stories about maybe Snowshoe Thompson that nobody told you about, or the stories about the valley. Like, what was that building? So one of the most fun things that Rick and I have enjoyed doing is looking around at buildings and saying, what was that? What did that used to be? Before it was a rundown, I saw what was it? And I'm going to share some of those stories and some of the forgotten stories of Carson Valley with you tonight. So, whether you grew up here, just drove through, one of the best things about Carson Valley, of course, is how much history is still here. And we found that there's lots of traces of history, if you know just where to look. So six stories that I'm going to share with you tonight are what we think of as totally Carson Valley. They're tales of the old days um, and about places that you may know. They all have to do with buildings or places that you've probably driven by or at least heard of, um, and hopefully some buildings that you've seen a million times. And I'm going to end up the talk tonight talking about your own family history and the importance of writing that down because our stories, we don't think of them that way, but our stories today are the history of tomorrow. And if you don't write it down, it really is gone. So first, let's kick off with some stories of the old days. And there's nothing quite as much fun as a good unsolved murder mystery. And we actually had quite a few of them here at Old Time Carson Valley. Now, murders, of course, aren't just a recent phenomenon. But the investigation of murder back in the days was hardly CSI. In fact, it was sometimes hard to keep the suspects even in custody while they were awaiting their trial. In fact, Genoa's jail was sort of notorious for repeatedly being broken out of. <laughs> Those bricks, you think of bricks as being really solid. Those bricks were made at the Adams Brick Factory, Brick Ranch. Um, and the bricks were really solid, but the mortar wasn't so good. And our first story is just one example of an unsolved mystery. I'm going to let, let you make up your own mind about who might have been responsible, because it's still technically unsolved. In 1895, Anna Sarman and her husband Fritz lived on the old Ferris Ranch, which was just north of Minden. This is Mr. Ferris. This is their ranch. That's the ranch house. Um, if you look really carefully, there's a big D on the hillside right up in the middle of that hill. You can't see it very well in this picture, but if you know where the D is on the hillside, that'll give you some idea where this was. Today it's just an open field a little north of Airport Road. But back in the day, the Simon's house sat at a crossroads where the road from Genoa, which was known as the Boyd Toll Road, cut across the valley and intersected the north-south Cradlebaugh Road. Anna and Fritz Simon 
had lived there peaceably for over a dozen years. Like so many, there's a better picture. There's a picture with it. That's what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> like so many early ranchers, Anna and Fritz hailed from Germany. They had three kids who were all grown and lived nearby. But May 8, 1895 turned out to be a very unlucky day for Anna Sarman. You might say it was a bloody unlucky day. Fritz, her husband, came in from the field mid-afternoon and he found Anna's bloody body in a bedroom and the bed had been set on fire. If you're going to commit a crime, even back then, they knew you had to kind of conceal the evidence, right? Anna had been struck in the head brutally, repeatedly, with an axe. Now they knew that a murder weapon was an axe because they found a bloody axe in a woodshed in the back of the home. And following the trail of blood, they learned, deduced, that she'd been killed in the living room and her body had been dragged into the bedroom where the fire was still raging when Fritz got home. He did successfully manage to put out the fire before it engulfed the whole house. So that at least was good. But then, Fritz went about his normal chores. <laughs> he milked his cows before telling anyone about finding his wife's body. Now the townsfolk thought that was rather strange. In fact, they thought it was so strange that, of course, rumors began to swirl that maybe Fritz had something to do with his wife's murder. Fritz, however, swore he was innocent, and he had a lot of friends and neighbors who were convinced he was, in fact, innocent. They were very confident he was not the murderer. So a search for a culprit continued. Turns out that a transient had been spotted on a nearby road about 3 p.m. on the day Anna was murdered. And surprisingly enough, the local constables were actually able to find this transient. His name was Jim Williams, and he was arrested. And he admitted, surprisingly enough, he admitted eating breakfast at the Sarman house earlier that day. It was fairly commonplace for ranchers' wives to feed unfortunate men who were passing by. So Mrs. Sarman had indeed served him a meal. But they tried collecting evidence, and when push came to shove, there just was not enough evidence to convict Jim Williams. In fact, the evidence, such evidence they had, tended to show that he really wasn't the one who committed the murder. So they released him from custody, and the search for the culprit continued. A second transient was arrested about two weeks later, and his name was Joseph Ritchie. He was arrested down in Bodie. There's a picture of Bodie here in the corner. Rhodey was a rough and tumble town, and sure enough, this Joseph Ritchie, too, confessed to having been in Carson Valley the day just before the murder. And his very bad luck was he wore a narrow shoe that, according to those diligent investigators, corresponded well to footprints that had been found outside near the Sarnia home. <coughs> Sounds like a good chance he was the culprit, right? But no, charges against him, too, eventually had to be dropped. There was no CSI back then. They couldn't lift fingerprints from the axe handle, they couldn't collect DNA at the crime scene, there was no video surveillance, and nobody ever confessed. Mm. Poor Fritz Sarman never got even to see the murderer brought to justice, and he was so distraught that he couldn't bring himself to even attend his wife's funeral. Now, does that sound like an innocent man or somebody who had, <laughs> who had a little guilt on his conscience? This is Anna's uh, gravestone at Genoa Cemetery. Mm -hmm. if, his, or if Fritz had been there at the cemetery when she was buried, he would have seen a tremendous outpouring of grief from the whole community. The whole community came together in events like this and just wanted to support the family and expressed their sorrow by showing up for funerals, among other things. There were some 60 wagons and buggies that pulled up at Genoa Cemetery on the day Anna Sarman was buried. And as for Fritz, it's possible he died of a broken heart. You'll remember that Anna was killed on May 8th? Well, if you look at his headstone or his plaque, he died almost exactly five years later, May 12th, 1900. So was Anna killed by one of those two transients? Was she killed by her husband? Um, we'll probably never really know for sure. Those cows, they're not talking. The murder of Anna Sarman remains a mystery to this very day. <coughs> Our second story is a good one about buried treasure. Everybody loves buried treasure, right? There are, of course, no sunken ships near Carson Valley, but that doesn't mean we don't have our share of buried treasure stories. 
Have you ever been down to Holbrook Junction on 395? There's another spot just before you get there on the east side of 395 that has a historic marker on it, identifying it as the former site of Double Springs. And after this next story, you might just be inclined to want to pay it a visit. Now, Double Springs was a very important site for the Washoe Indians for centuries. Families from all over the valley would gather there in the fall excuse me, for the annual pine nut gathering and harvest. It was a big celebration that happened every year. And here is a Washoe family. This probably was taken at Lake Tahoe, not, not at um, Double Springs, but it kind of gives you a sense of the family and the baskets they used for collecting pine nuts. Um, there's, a, there's a cooking basket here and also a big gathering basket on the far right. For one thing, of course, this was a site where there were abundant pine nut trees close by, and as the name Double Springs implies, there were also two springs that provided water. So it was a good spot to get everyone together, and as many as 500 Native Americans would assemble there every fall. Well, in the early days of Carson Valley, some mining began to go on in the pine nuts, and the Aurora Bodie Road went through there too, heading south. And a stage station soon opened at Double Springs. This is not a really easy to see map, but you can see on the far right hand side of the um, map illustration, this is a Bodie telegraph line, and there was the Bodie Road, the big square, there's sort of a lobby looking thing. The big square to the right of it is where the Double Springs station was. Now stages, of course, were a regular form of transportation and they stopped at uh, Double Springs and other places. They operated on a fairly predictable and regular schedule, like taking the bus today, right? And that made them exceedingly convenient for stage workers, because they knew what the schedule was going to be. The stage robbers soon figured out that stages made a pretty easy target. There might be a shipment of gold or other valuables aboard, and even if not, there were lots of passengers with pockets to pick who might have gold watches or other valuables with them. So segue along now to 1863. The Comstock mines were bustling. Aurora was in full swing to the south. Here's an image of Aurora. And you can see how close Bodie is. This is the town of uh, Aurora and one of the uh, mining company stocks from there. And you can also see the stage roads coming, to, uh, coming into Aurora and winding its way north. So picture a stagecoach jostling its way along the dirt roadway near the station at Double Springs. And out of the stage rush stepped a man, an armed highwayman. He was alone, but he had a gun. Maybe it was an inside job, or maybe he just had exceptionally good luck. But in any event, that robber hit payday. That particular stagecoach was carrying $17,000 in gold coin. That's a few bucks. That's a few bucks. Now that $17,000 would be worth close to $350,000 in today's money. That's a lot of loot. But think about how heavy that many gold coins would be. Even riding a horse, a single robber likely wasn't going to get very far carrying such a heavy load. But like all good criminals, this one had thought ahead. <laughs> he brought a shovel. <laughs> and somewhere in the flats, not far from Double Springs, he dug a hole and he buried his loot. And what happened to the robber? Well, according to the legend, he was finally apprehended from some other crime, and he spent the final days of his life in the Nevada State Prison. Getting close to death, the robber knew he couldn't take his ill-gotten gold with him to the next life. So on his deathbed, the story goes that he finally described the exact spot where he buried all that loot. Are you ready? <laughs> he said it was on the south side of Double Springs, near a small cabin. Okay, so we know Double Springs is kind of like that red square to the upper right. There was a small cabin, there's a little square black dot in the lower right, lower kind of center part of the picture there. There's a small cabin. I don't know that that's it, but there is a small cabin there. Um, so it was somewhere there near a small cabin. Um, and about a mile and a half north of another way station known as Mountain House, which is right near Holbrook Junction. So that seems like it kind of locates it at least somewhat in a general area. And over many years, Many Carson Valley lads tried their best to find that buried treasure, as you can imagine. 
One local named George Dale was said to have dug up a good-sized ranch in a vain search for the treasure. <laughs> Another, I love this story. Another local, Charlie Holbrook, tried to use a divining rod. You know, people use divining rods for all kinds of things, finding water, finding water mains. But this fellow thought it could find buried gold. So Charlie Holbrook was determined. And when his divining rod tipped down and located a spot, told him he found the right spot, and he kept digging and digging and digging. <laughs> And he finally got 28 feet deep before he finally threw in the shovel. <laughs> so he was convinced. Another Genoa resident named Henry Rice had a dream in 1891 that revealed to him the exact spot where the treasure was going to be found. He was sure of it. He was so excited, he rounded up a male friend and they brought with them several young ladies because of course the young ladies wanted to be with them when they found the treasure. And they all hightailed it from Genoa by wagon down to Double Springs. <coughs> where their hopes were dashed. Sadly, they found a hundred places that looked just exactly like the site he'd seen in his dream. <laughs> As you can imagine, this one's wish of sage horse looks like another. But the good news was they did get a picnic out of it. They and the ladies didn't just waste their trip. If you think about it though, all of that disappointment is actually kind of a good thing in the end, right? Because if you believe the old legend, the lost stagecoach treasure must still be out there, just waiting for somebody to find it. You want to go look for it? <laughs> <laughs> now we got some volunteers here. Our third story is about what I call the ugly duckling of Gardnerville. You know that really ugly wooden building, no offense to David Shakita, at the S Bend of Gardnerville, the one in sad need of fresh paint where half the siding on the front's peeled off, revealing old boards beneath. That building somebody ran into with a car not long ago. I was always curious about that building. Like, it looked kind of forlorn and forgotten, but to me it looked like that, that building had a story. There was something there that I had to learn. So we sort of dug around. We asked some of the old timers. They told us that it used to be a laundry in the 40s and 50s up until about the 70s, but what was it before that? Well, with a little bit of digging and with a lot of help from the great records here at the Historical Society, we found out it used to be a school. And at one time, it was the pride of East Fork. It was actually built for the East Fork School District in 1880, and it did not originally sit right where it sits today at the Espen. It was actually three miles to the south, just north of today's smoke shop on the east side of the river. Here's an 1876 newspaper notice where they had a, a different school, the original school, and they decided to move it. And then they changed their minds after they moved it, and they decided in 1880 they really needed a brand new school. So they built this one. Now the students who attended there, the list of their names sounds like a who's who from early Carson Valley. There were kids from the Hoosman family. There were a lot of other big names like Jacobson, Rodenbach, Dangberg. Burning, Selmeyer, Springmeyer, Sill, and more. Now in this picture, this is uh, some of the students that are surrounding their teacher. Supposedly, according to the lettering on the back of the photograph, supposedly the teacher is in the far back right. But I think it's actually the woman in the center. Just mm -hmm. That would be my guess anyway. Um, anyway, the, the local East Fork ranchers aspired to make their East Fork school the best one in the whole county except for maybe Genoa, because they thought they couldn't beat Genoa. But it was going to be the best they could make it. They really wanted to provide the best for their kids. They purchased new desks in 1882. And they also purchased a fine chapel organ, which was added in 1884. And they had a great school bell added to the building, too. And the schoolhouse functioned as more than just a school, or more than what we think of as a school today. It was a gathering place for the whole community. They had Sunday services there that certainly made the organ practical. Um, but the, the organs were also played often for the kids, and the kids would sing in school. Um, they had Sunday services there. When voting time rolled around, that's where they would, you would go to cast your vote. And the teachers would put together programs, they called it, featuring the kids as their actors and actresses. And they'd sell tickets at 50 cents a head to raise money to buy books for the school library. Now, my favorite story about some of those programs was that some very smart teacher decided that some of the songs that the kids were going to be performed, you know, they wanted to please the parents, make everybody happy, those songs were going to be sung in German. <laughs> I'm sure the parents really approved of that. There was no dithering with fancy concepts like separation of church and state, 
Christmas celebrations for the whole community took place here. But they did celebrate separate the boys from the girls. The schoolhouse originally had two doors on this front, one for boys, one for girls. And if you look carefully at this old building at the S Bend, if you look at the framework around those two windows on either side, um, the windows were a later addition. There were doors there originally, um, on one on each side of today's entryway. Some 20 to 40 kids would attend school each semester at the original East Forest School, and many, many, many kids passed through its doors over its 35-year lifespan. But in 1915, school districts were combining for efficiency's sake. We were beginning to get cars, after all. And as Minden became more settled, children were living closer to town. The East Fork Schoolhouse had outlived its usefulness as a school, but a sturdy wooden building like that could not go to waste. Henry Elges bought the building and had it moved to its present location there at the S Bend, where he used it as a green goods and vegetable store, and later the Ellis family had a grocery store there as well. By the 1930s, the building had become a Chinese laundry, and it was acquired in August 1940 by the Nishikita family. Now, some of you may remember Joe and Mitzi Nishikita, who operated the laundry there after Joe got back from serving in World War II. He was stationed in Germany, and that's where he met and married Mitzi. Joe actually tried to enlist several times before the army would take him, and that's a story in itself. All told, the Nishikita family had that laundry for over 25 years, and the building is still owned by the Nishikita descendants today. It's in pretty sad, sad shape these days, especially after getting hit by a car. And there's talk about having to demolish it entirely, and I confess that would make me very sad. At one point, it used to be the pride of East Fork. And our fourth story is another ugly duckling building story. This one is right in downtown Gardnerville, Gardnerville, and you may have driven by it a million times and never paid any attention to this building. I know I did. When I finally saw it there, it's like, what is that? Um, it's right opposite Sharkey's, and it's so nondescript that um, you really don't think much of it, but there's actually a historic plaque on the side. You can kind of just see right to the right of the door, there's two <coughs> little plaques, and one of those is a historic plaque. This was the Gardnerville Branch Jail. It was a satellite jail for a time when Genoa was the county seat. It had fold-down metal frames, like kind of like Murphy beds, for the prisoners down below, and upstairs the judge had his uh, officer headquarters. And believe it or not, this was a big improvement over what deputies used to do with their prisoners. This was the judge, L.S. Ezell. Looks like kind of a no-nonsense guy, doesn't he? He had been the Justice Court judge since 1884, and he owned a granary building on the same property. And he kindly allowed the constables to lock up offenders there if they didn't want to haul them all the way to Genoa, where they had the real jail, the big jail, the main jail. Um, you can imagine throwing somebody into a granary, a lot of dust and dirt, right? The local newspaper called it a vile hole, no fit place for a human being. And he was the judge, so he got to do what he wanted to do. Nothing changed until 1909 when, after 25 years on the bench, Ezell finally retired. He kindly don donated his granary building to the property just in case they wanted to keep using it as a holding cell. The county commissioners approved building a new concrete jail here in 1910, and they paid $25 to Lewis Springwire to draw up the plans. Pretty fancy, huh? It started out to be a one-story tall building, but you know how government goes. The size doubled, the cost probably doubled too. And by the way, now they needed a salary for a jailer, $2 a day, or he got paid $4 when he was running the chain gang, fixing the roads. This was only going to be a branch jail, though. The main jail was still in Genoa. But then on June 28, 1910, many of you know, a fire wiped out most of the town of Genoa. The story goes that they already had one prisoner in custody at the Genoa jail, who they took out and chained to a post before they could move him to this still under construction Gardnerville jail. So pretty soon after, the county seat was moved to Minden. That's the new Minden Courthouse there at the very center in the far back. And it had jail cells in the basement when it was built in 1916. So the branch jail was supposed to be discontinued, but it wasn't. For reasons of economy, convenience, habit, or lingering tensions between Gardnerville and Minden, the old branch jail continued to be used to house prisoners well into the 1950s. 
Today it is actually on the National Register. The application diplomatically describes this building as an excellent example of turn of the century architecture. <laughs> I love whoever wrote that. With steel cages, large hasps and padlocks, a wood stove for heat, and of course those great fold down beds. Moral of the story, sometimes there's some great history buried beneath the surface of the worst ugly ducklings. So I hope you'll carry that story with you and remember to appreciate even the ugly ducklings because they may not be around here forever either. Our fifth story is another murder tale. And interestingly enough, it's also about Double Springs, the same places that went about our buried treasure. There's not much left to mark the site, of course, of that original Double Springs station in the 1860s, except a historic plaque beside Highway 395. But there used to be, as I told you, an early hotel and stage shop here serving the Aurora Bodie trade. The station was acquired by James Dean in 1863, and we think this is a photo of James Dean himself, the station keeper. Now, Dean himself was a colorful and slightly shady character who held several offices in the territorial government days. He served briefly as a Justice of the Peace for Genoa, and he also served in the House of Representatives for the Territorial Legislature in 1863. By late 1863, he moved here to Double Springs, and he was operating a, quote, first-class hotel here, along with his wife, Fanny. One day in 1864, a teamster stopped in at Double Springs Station, and he discovered Fanny's lifeless body on the floor. She had been beaten severely, and her head was jammed into a bucket of water. Her husband, James Dean, was arrested, and of course, you can imagine, he proclaimed his innocence. Here again, it was a spot where travelers came and went, and it could have been anyone. But the neighbors, however, were not satisfied with the story he told. However, because there was no evidence of his involvement, they didn't have CSI, they were forced to let him go. He sold the station the following year, 1865, to P.L. Sprague, and went on to Walker River Re Precinct to the south, and somehow he managed to get himself elected as Justice of the Peace there. <laughs> Dean's next few years were kind of rocky. He got married a second time in 1869, but it seems he wasn't really cut out for marriage. His second wife divorced him in 72. There's more of his story in our book, but the bottom line was Dean died in 1910 in Michigan from cancer of the head and general senility, which was a euphemism for old age. He would have been about 80 years old. Now, cancer of the head is kind of an odd cause of death. And it was never proven, of course, that he was the one who shoved Fanny's head in a bucket of water and killed her. But if he did, head in a bucket of water, cancer of the head, it sort of seems like fate did eventually catch up with James Dean. Our sixth story is about a little house in Minden on Mono Avenue. Does that look familiar? Yeah. It's right across the street from the old brick Minden Elementary School. And it's kind of hard, it's a little bit of a fuzzy picture, it's kind of hard to see that sign over the door, but it just says justice. And justice was indeed dispensed here at one time. Judge Walt Fisher and his wife Alice and their kids lived here. He was elected Justice of the Peace for the East Fork Township in 1954, taking office the following January of 55. And it was actually a second career for him. He had worked for the V&T Road for over 40 years, serving as the station master for a part of that time here in Minden. One of his very first judicial acts when he was elected involved a fellow whose face is probably going to be very familiar to you. That's right, Clark Gable. As you probably know, Clark Gable was very fond of coming to Carson Valley. There's a great photo of him, and I think it was Carol Lombard. He, he was married here. Uh, previously, before he came here this time. Uh, there's a photo of him and his bride inside Sharky's Casino. But in 1955, he came here to be married to an actress named Kay Williams. It was her third marriage, and it was his fifth. And they probably didn't want any big advance publicity. Now, Judge Fisher had no idea that a marriage was even being planned. Gable and his intended showed up late in the day to apply for a marriage license. And the Douglas County clerk just called up Judge Fisher's house and asked if a couple could come over and be married at his house. Well, of course, he said, fine, send them over. She didn't bother to mention who she was sending. So you can imagine Judge Fisher's surprise when he opened the door and here's Clark Gable. As luck would have it, they'd even brought their own witnesses with them. 
Now, Mrs. Fisher sometimes got to double in and step in to be a witness when there were marriages in the house. But in this case, she was in the back row. She had no idea who was there. So they were, they were married and stepped out. They, they pressed some money into the judge's hand and they left. And she didn't even know who'd been in her home until several minutes after they left. And she went and looked out the window and saw them driving away. It is said that the judge paid dearly for not telling her. <laughs> but my best story about Judge Fisher involves his stint not as a judge, but as a priest. Not a real priest, mind you, but here's how it happened. One morning, very early in the morning, a lady driver was back in her car away from a bar, and as drunk people sometimes do, she hit a parked car. The sheriff's deputies responded, they determined the lady was still very drunk, and they took her into custody and hauled her off to Judge Fisher's house at 4.30 in the morning. The judge, of course, had been fast asleep, so when the officers knocked on the door with this very drunk woman, he answered the door in his bathroom. There stood the officers, there stood the very drunk woman, and she was so drunk, she mistook Judge Fisher in his black bathrobe for a Catholic priest. <laughs> he's not a priest, the officers assisted, he's the judge. Well, that didn't sit too well with her early, either. The very drunk woman began berating Judge Fisher for impersonating a priest. <laughs> and that earned her the rest of the night in jail. The next morning, the regular court session began, and as usual, they brought the in-custody prisoners in, and she was still too tipsy to face the music. So in his infinite wisdom, Judge Fisher ordered another 24 hours free lodging in the calaboose, plus a $100 fine, and that's how justice was served back in the day. Now, I talked a little bit in the beginning of this talk about the Nishikita family. We have Dave Nishikita here with us today. I'm so honored that he decided to come. Dave, stick your hand up. Here's Dave. Yay. Dave has compiled a wonderful oral history of his family. I just want to show you the book. He did a wonderful job with that, writing down his memories and compiling pictures to go with it, documenting the family history uh, here in Gardnerville for so many years, and his parents' respective histories from where they both came from, one from Germany and one from, uh, his family was from Japan, but um, from the United States here, but as a Japanese American. Um, it was really special to be able to be part of that project to compile that book, and I um, am really touched that he took the time to do it and to make sure that those stories aren't forgotten. Um, he's got pictures of his mom and dad standing on top of Hitler's bombed out bunker in Germany. There's a story of how his dad was in an internment camp before he got out and enlisted to, leaving the internment camp, he enlisted not, as soon as he was able to enlist after the war broke out to serve this country. I mean, what a touching story. Um, I just kind of wanted to make a pitch that everyone has family stories to tell, stories of their own life, stories that have been handed down to you. And that's a different kind of history sharing. And I really want to encourage you to write the stories down before they become forgotten tales. The museum has been kind enough to stock our memoir book in the bookstore um, because we just never know how many days we have left to write things down, right? Um, and of course, there are plenty more tales of murder and buried treasure in our forgotten tales book, which many of you probably already read. Um, we hope you've enjoyed these long forgotten tales about our beautiful valley. And I want to know if you have any questions about this and about history here or about writing memoirs. Any questions? Yes. What was the year the Clark came away about? I didn't catch that. I want to say 1955. It was shortly after he took office in 55. Okay. And then I heard or read, and I might be wrong, that there is an initiative to restore the old jail. Does anyone know about that? You're talking about the, the one the by Sharkey. The one by Sharkies. Um, there's something on the sign here that is, or, oh, what is that? Well, there was something about that it might be possibly used, reused in a different capacity. Yes, oh. I'd heard something about that. Okay. There, there wasn't, but I, as far as I know, nothing's happened yet. Maybe, do you know? Oh, I had read, I think, in the newspaper that the second floor has been infested with bats. Oh. And in the last week or two, I haven't seen them. So maybe they're working on it. I'm assuming 
of Sheila knew maybe about a plan to restore that to y'all. That would be great. Yes? Can I get a copy of that deathbed confession of that transcript of that $17,000 of the building? Now? I'm going to go. I'm going to organize a search party. Anybody else? Anybody have family stories they want to share about old time Gardnerville? Well, thank you. Yes. All right. Boy Scout meetings were used. I didn't know that. What year would that have been? use that way. Well, thank you all so much for coming. If there's anything else I can ever do to, to help, please let me know. Um, I've really enjoyed talking about history, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing some forgotten tales that other people probably don't know about.